Welcome to this video lecture on the respiratory system, where we will explore the structure of the respiratory tract and lungs that allow for the gas exchange that sustains life. My name is Christopher Demas, and I will be guiding you through these topics. Let us start by thinking about the placement of the respiratory system within a human body. I will draw on a human silhouette, and then we can start to place the important structures of the respiratory system within the body. I will briefly provide an overview of some of the initial structures of the respiratory system, and if you are unfamiliar with these structures, make sure to go back and review them after this video. The first part of the respiratory system involves the orifices that allow for air to enter the system, which includes the mouth and the nose. Air then enters the mouth or the nasal cavity, and then these two air pathways combine to form the pharynx. At the very bottom of the pharynx is the esophagus and the larynx which is the voice box where the vocal cords are located. At the very top of the larynx is the epiglottis, which is a flap of cartilage that closes over the opening to the larynx during swallowing to prevent aspiration of food. After the larynx is the trachea. There are two divisions of the respiratory system I will emphasize in this lecture, the conducting division and the respiratory division. The conducting division is the airway responsible for air transport from outside the body to the alveoli where gas exchange occurs, as well as to clean, moisten, and warm this air. Gas exchange occurs exclusively in the respiratory division of the respiratory tract. We will start with a discussion of the conducting division of the respiratory system, starting with the trachea. The trachea extends from the larynx to the bifurcation of the two primary bronchi. The trachea would be quite compressible and prone to collapse if not for the cartilaginous cage surrounding the tube. There are C-shaped rings of haline cartilage within the trachea. These rings open in the back and provide the structural integrity of the trachea. Let's take a look at an H&E stained slide of the trachea underneath the microscope. This slide shows a horizontal slice of the trachea and captures part of the incomplete ring of haline cartilage shown in blue. The next part of the respiratory tract is the two primary bronchi, which I will draw in now. Remember that the right branch, which is hidden from view, is essentially vertical. The left primary bronchus has to pass around the heart, which is located on the left side, making the left primary bronchus more horizontal. Remember that when you are facing a patient, the patient's left is what you see on the right. This patient-centered orientation is something that you'll get used to with time. Let's go ahead and take a cross-section of the primary bronchus and compare that to the trachea that we saw previously. Notice how the cartilage found in the bronchus is a continuous ring of haline cartilage, unlike the C-shaped cartilage found in the trachea. Let's move on now to the next part of the conducting division of the respiratory tract. As the primary bronchi further branch and enter the lung tissue, they become secondary and tertiary bronchi. These secondary and tertiary bronchi are smaller in diameter, and the organization of the cartilage changes to discontinuous plates rather than continuous rings. Also, it is important to note that unlike the secondary bronchi, the tertiary bronchi contain a prominent layer of smooth muscle in their wall. The tertiary bronchi then become small airways called bronchioles. The bronchioles do not contain any cartilage or glands. The larger bronchioles have pseudostratified ciliated epithelium as shown here. There are three characteristics of the bronchioles that you should be familiar with. First being the star-shaped lumen. Two, the lack of cartilage in the wall of the bronchiole. And three, the layer of prominent smooth muscle in the wall of the bronchiole. Since this topic can be quite challenging, I'm going to provide a quick mid-lecture summary. So far, we have discussed that the air enters the tract through the mouth and nose and passes through the trachea. It can then either pass through one of the two primary bronchi. The air then has a number of choices as it can pass through any of the secondary or tertiary bronchi 
and then pass on into the bronchioles. The next pathway of the respiratory tract is the terminal bronchioles, and it is the last part of the conducting division. The epithelium is now simple columnar, or cuboidal. The walls of the terminal bronchioles are less than one millimeter in diameter and contain no cartilage in their wall, as shown here on lung schematic. The walls of the bronchioles have a relatively large amount of smooth muscle and elastic fibers, which helps to regulate air intake and provide structural support. A clinical correlation to help you remember this fact is that during an asthma attack, the smooth muscles in the terminal bronchioles are the tissues that constrict airflow. Now we're going to move on to the respiratory division. The first part of the respiratory division is the respiratory bronchioles, which is adequately named since it has respiratory in the name. The respiratory bronchioles are very similar in structure to the terminal bronchioles with a thick layer of smooth muscle. However, the respiratory bronchioles are in close association with capillaries derived from the pulmonary arteries which enable gas exchange. They also contain outpouchings of alveoli which we will talk about next. The final spaces that make up the majority of the respiratory division are the alveolar ducts and sacs, which leads to the key structures we'll focus on, the alveoli. Let's go ahead and take a cross-section of the alveoli and investigate its histological properties. Notice the red blood cells that can be visualized in the wall of the alveoli that provide the immense surface area needed to provide gas exchange to the whole body. It is important to note that this fine structure is supported by elastic and collagen fibers. The walls of the alveoli are made of two types of cells, the simple squamous type 1 pneumocyte and the cuboidal type 2 pneumocyte. The type 1 pneumocyte makes up about 95% of the alveolar wall, and its thin structure allows for diffusion between red blood cells and the air cavity. Type 2 pneumocytes make up the remaining 5% of the alveolar wall and are responsible for producing pulmonary surfactant. Surfactant lowers the surface tension within these fine structures and prevents alveolar collapse. And with that, we are completed with the topics for this lecture. The main takeaways and things to be familiar with in this lecture are the structures that make up the two divisions of the respiratory system, the conducting and respiratory divisions. Within each category, it is important to know the key features mentioned for each part of the respiratory tract and to be able to recognize the structure on stained slides. Within the conducting division, remember how the trachea is the largest airway with C-shaped cartilaginous rings, while the primary bronchi contains full rings of cartilage and the secondary and tertiary bronchi have irregular plates of cartilage. Remember that the bronchioles do not contain cartilage, but rather have a prominent layer of smooth muscle for support. Terminal bronchi are similar to the bronchioles in that they have smooth muscle. However, the bronchioles are smaller and contain elastic fibers as well. Remember how all the structures within the respiratory division are involved in gas exchange. Respiratory bronchioles are the first part of this division and are similar to the bronchioles discussed previously with the exception that they are in close association with capillaries and contain alveolar outpouchings. The final structures are the alveoli, which provides the necessary surface area for gas exchange. Within the alveolar wall, remember the two important cell types, the highly abundant type 1 pneumocyte, which are thin and allow for gas exchange, and the type 2 pneumocytes that secrete surfactant to prevent lung collapse. Thanks so much for joining me in this lecture, and I hope you found this to be helpful.